Let's uh, pause for a moment of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we remain grateful for the fact that you've given us a plumb line of truth in your word. We're living in a world of deception and change constantly. And yet in the midst of all of that, we can come to your word and find uh, eternal principles that we can use to build our lives upon. With that being said, Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work through your ministry of illumination, uh, both in Sunday school, the main service that follows as we look at portions of your word. I pray you'll be with every class that's meeting even as I am speaking. We're in great need, Father, of the illuminating ministry of the Spirit of God. A human teacher cannot see all the different needs that your people have this morning, but you know what they are, and you can use your word to meet the deepest level of need in a person's life. We just uh, invite you to do that this morning as your word is taught here at Sugarland Bible Church. In preparation for that ministry of illumination, we're just gonna take a few moments of silence to do personal confession before you if need be. We understand that nothing can change our position in you. But there are things we do in our natural selves, sinful selves, that impede our moment-by-moment enjoyment of you and fellowship with you. So we're just going to take a moment right now, Father, to exercise 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if needed. We're thankful, Lord, for the comprehensiveness of your provision for us, providing not just our justification before you, but providing for lapses of fellowship. We do ask now that you'll be with us as we study. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, let's um, take our Bibles this morning and open them to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, and verse 12. Um, sort of continuing to deal with here in 2 Thessalonians 3, the, the purity of the church. Of course, the church has already been declared pure by Jesus, but how does the church maintain its practice uh, in a sinful world? Uh, how does the church keep itself pure consistent with its identity. That's a, that's a tough one. And what we're discovering here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is God has given to the church two great tools to do that. One of which is something called ecclesiastical separation, which we've seen a little bit about in this chapter. And the second tool that God has given is church discipline. I guarantee you uh, these are probably two of the most unpopular topics to talk about today. Uh, Ecclesiastical separation, what are you talking about? Don't you understand the ecumenical call that we all have to have the urge to merge kind of thing? Um, And uh, church discipline, what are you talking about here? Kicking people out of a church? I mean, that's not going to work well. If they get kicked out of First Baptist, they'll just join Second Baptist or 500th Baptist. (laughs) So these are topics that really aren't very American. They're very not ecumenical, but as you can see, they're right there in your New Testament. 
So I find it interesting that a lot of people, when they study the Thessalonian letters, will gravitate towards certain parts of those letters, the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, you know, the day of the Lord, the man of sin in the temple, 2 Thessalonians 2, and it's almost like people skip right, at, right over the last chapter of the Thessalonian letters because they deal with these issues of practical purity in an age of impurity and unholiness. So 2 Thessalonians, as you remember, has three parts to it. Uh, it's pretty easy to remember. Each chapter is a section. All of these begin with the letter C. 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul commends the Thessalonians for their growth in Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, he corrects them as an apostle because they had received a forged letter indicating that they were in the tribulation period, which was very unsettling to them. It, it caught, you'll notice verse two of chapter two, it, they had been shaken. That's the word for an earthquake. <laughs> uh, a theological earthquake had gone off in Thessalonica because they got this letter allegedly coming from Paul saying, you're in the tribulation period when Paul had taught them in the first letter and when he was with them when he planted the church that you won't be in the tribulation period. You'll be taken to heaven before the tribulation period starts. And so if Paul is wrong here, he could be wrong about anything. So what Paul does in chapter two is he explains to them you're not in the tribulation period because if you were in the tribulation period, you'd be seeing five things, which you're not seeing right now. So therefore, this letter coming from me needs to be dismissed as a forgery and go back to the original teaching I gave you. And then in chapter three, he deals with the consequences of wrong doctrine. So a lack of orthodoxy, cor correct belief, ortho, correct as an orthodontist that corrects your mouth <laughs> or teeth or whatever. Orthodoxy, if you don't have orthodoxy, correct belief, it will lead to a lack of orthopraxy, correct practice. So bad practice follows bad doctrine like night follows the day. So if your doctrine is wrong and you think you're in the tribulation period and you think that Jesus is touching down on planet Earth in less than seven years, well, I, I guess I don't really have to pay down my credit card debt, right, if that's true. I guess I don't have to pay off my mortgage Oh, I, don't, I guess I don't have to put my kids in school. Uh, by the way, I'm kind of going through a little trauma here. My, my daughter was shipped off yesterday to do her Disciple Makers Multiplied program. So I'm like in a, an official empty nester. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> I wasn't emotionally ready for that one, but... I'm sure she's happy. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, why, why go through the trouble of school? Why go through the trouble of training? Jesus is coming back in less than seven years. And so you, you're dealing with a, a group of people that had sort of left life's responsibilities. And so Paul deals with that whole subject in chapter three. So in the first five verses, after talking about the importance of prayer, verses one through five, he now gives an exhortation to discipline, church discipline, the idol, not I-D-O-L, idol, but I-D-L-E, idol. Uh, what do you do with people that just quit on life's responsibilities, wouldn't hold down jobs? Well, Paul says there's two things you do with such people after they've been fairly and safely warned. Number one, you separate from them. Number two, you exercise church discipline. 
And there's a, sort of a combination of those two ideas here in verses 6 through 15. So we're actually there in verse 12. Verse 6, he gave the exhortation. Verses 7 through 9, he, appoint, he pointed to himself. Because remember, there's a very short distance of time between when Paul planted the church at Thessalonica and when he wrote to them. There's probably no more than six months to a year in between those two. It's not like Philippians where there's like a 10-year delay between Paul planting the church at Philippi and then writing to them from Roman prison much later. This is different. So they had a very clear remembrance of what Paul was like six months to a year earlier where he supported himself through his tent-making trade, verses seven through nine. And although he had a right as an apostle to receive support for his ministry, he decided to forego that right because he wanted to be an example of what the Christian life looks like in terms of its industriousness. And so he deals with that in verses seven through nine, and then he gives the reason, verses 10 and 11, and he says, there's the great verse, uh, if any man is not willing to work, neither should he eat either. Verses 10 and 11. And then we pick it up here in verse 12 where he continues to exhort the, the lazy. They're basically using doctrine, false doctrine, as sort of a cover for their own laziness. Uh, because, you know, getting up and working a regular job every day is difficult. And so who, who wouldn't want to escape that, right? By the way, the socialism, which I'll talk a little bit about today, if time permits, is uh, gaining ascendancy among our youth like never before. I mean, never in my lifetime would I have thought like a guy like Bernie Sanders you know, an open socialist would be such a mainstream, you know, political figure and almost win the Democratic Party primary uh, a few years back. Some people actually think he won it because it's not who votes that counts, but who counts the votes. <laughs> um, and so you have all of these young people that think socialism is great. And... Um, if you don't have a knowledge of the Word of God and if you don't have a knowledge of history, why not think it's great? It allows you to get out of the menial tasks of life. It allows you an escape from the consequence of the fall, which we'll talk about a little earlier. So a lot of people will use socialism just as sort of, or, or bad doctrine, sort of as an excuse to get out of responsibilities of life. So that's what Paul here is dealing with in verse 12. So let's take a look at that. And I just got my prescription for my glasses changed. And they changed it so well I can't read my Bible anymore. Because <laughs> I got my distance glasses on. So if I mangle a few things, you'll have to just bear with me. He now says, now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and to eat their own bread. So you'll notice right off the bat, verse 12, he uses this expression, we command. And he's talked like this all the way through this book, uh, particularly at the end of chapter 2 into chapter three, he keeps saying, we command, uh, we say to you, and you, you, know, you say to yourself, what, what is wrong with this guy? Does he have like an authoritarian complex or something? Well, he's functioning as an apostle. And Jesus in the upper room was very clear when he was talking to the 11. He said, I have many things to tell you now, but you can't bear them. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, by the way, the spirit of truth would come upon the church at the day of Pentecost. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will bring all things to your remembrance. 
He will teach you all things. And then later Jesus says, he will disclose to you the things that are to come. So when Jesus made that statement, he was basically saying that he himself, and this is sort of counterintuitive the first time you hear this, it almost sounds heretical because we have red letter editions of our Bible, right? Why do we have red letter editions of our Bible? Because those are the words Jesus spoke. So I guess if it's not in red, it's not important, right? We, we have the license plates, what would Jesus do, right? But Jesus in the upper room said, I'm not the source of total truth. In other words, he is the incarnate son of God. He's the highest authority that has ever graced this planet. He's the monogenes, the one of a kind, the incarnate son of God. But at the same time, he is saying that in the upper room, I've got a lot more to say to you, but you can't handle it. To quote that great theologian, Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth yet, but when the spirit comes, you'll be able to handle it. And what he's saying is the spirit is going to raise up these apostles to write 27 New Testament books that are going to fill in the gaps. So when he says, I'll bring all things to your remembrance, he's speaking of the Gospels that would be developed later, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I will teach you all things. That's probably a reference to the epistles. Uh, the epistles are not the wives of the apostles, amen? Epistles are letters. Thirteen, Paul would write. Uh, an additional eight would come, known as the general letters. And then he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will teach you the things that are to come. That's most likely a reference to the book of Revelation. So Jesus did not author a single book of the Bible. You know, let's open our Bibles this morning to first Jesus chapter three. I mean, you're not going to find that. Uh, why not? Because of what Jesus said in the upper room. I can't reveal everything to you because you can't handle it, but the Spirit is going to take these truths that I'm sort of laying out in infant form, and he's going to guide these apostles into pinning the New Testament canon. So that's Paul being one of those writers of 13 epistles could say over and over again, we say, we command. You have to take Paul's language and put it on equal par with Jesus. They're both writing, Jesus speaking, Paul writing with the exact same authority. Very important to understand because a lot of people are into this mindset that, you know, you know, Paul was a misogynist and Paul hated homosexuals and, you know, he hated women and he had an attitude problem. And so people have this tendency to kind of take Paul's stuff and say, ah, that's just Paul. I'm a red letter Christian myself. That's what they call themselves, red letter Christians. I'm a Jesus guy and not a Paul guy. And at first you hear that and it sounds so spiritual. You know, when someone just says, I'm into Jesus, but they're not really into Jesus because Jesus himself said, I've got a lot to say to you, but you can't bear it now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he speaking to the apostles, will guide you into all truth. So that's how we understand these sort of commands that Paul gives. Now we command. That's why he's saying what he's saying. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, and then verse 12, he'll say things like this, dealing with divorce and remarriage. Uh, he'll, he'll say, now here's what the Lord says, but not I. And then a verse later, he'll say, here's what I say, but not the Lord. So I'm now commenting on something that Jesus didn't comment on, is what he's saying. And I have the authority to do it because of what Jesus said in the upper room concerning the coming of the Spirit of God and the encapsulating of New Testament revelation. And this is what, you know, gave a lot of people in the first century world sort of a problem with Paul. You know, I mean, who do you think you are? 
And so Paul has to spend all this time, you see it in early Galatians, you see it particularly in 2 Corinthians, defending his apostleship. Because once it's understood who Paul is as an official apostle of the Lord, it enhances his authority to speak aggressively into matters related to the church. So he says here now, such persons, the idol, we command. And then you'll notice in the second part of verse two, he says, and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that I believe Jesus, everything we know about him, he was pretty much a blue collar guy. I mean, he got up and went to work and knew what it was like to eke out a living, you know, like anybody else. I I really can't find the verse that tells me that Jesus was a carpenter. If you know that verse, maybe you could let me know. I don't know if there's any verse that really says that, but we do know that his father was a carpenter. So it's kind of assumed that if his father was a carpenter, his father taught him the trade. Um, An ancient uh, rabbinical saying in Judaism is if you don't teach your children a trade, you'll teach them to be a criminal. (laughs) So, you know, passing on a trade uh, where you could survive economically was a very important part of uh, first century Judaism. And over in Matthew 13, verse 55, when Jesus is claiming his authority as the son of God, it says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James and Joseph, Simon and Judas? So there's a reference to him being a carpenter's son. And so it's kind of assumed from that that he operated in the vocation of a carpenter just as Paul the apostle in Thessalonica exhibited his trade as a, as a uh, tent maker. So Paul's not asking these people who don't want to work uh, to be any different than Jesus himself and any different than the Apostle Paul when he was with them. So verse 12, he says, Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion. Now this isn't new. Um, he talked about this in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. He says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Uh, the Greek there is not a piece of duct tape on your mouth where you can't talk. <laughs> it's just kind of a life that's not obnoxious and not overly intrusive. Make it your ambition, your goal in life, in other words, to lead a quiet life, to attend to your own business, and to work with your hands just as we, here's the authority again, just as we commanded you. So this should be your goal as a Christian. You're quiet, not silent, because we share the gospel wherever we go, but we're not obnoxious, intrusive people. We're basically minding our own business because I don't have to show up constantly looking for handouts if I'm supporting myself and I'm not a busybody unnecessarily intruding into other people's lives because I'm working with my hands. You know, diligent, menial, uh, middle class, working class labor that you would expect from a carpenter, that you would expect from uh, someone that earns their living from uh, tent making, etc. And then the last part of verse 12, to work in quiet fashion and to eat their own bread. You should probably, if you're, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible, if, if you've got an English translation that says own, own bread, you should circle the word or underline the word own uh, if you're an underliner. Proverbs 25 verse 17 says, let your foot rarely be in your neighbor's house or he will become weary of you and hate you. (laughs) 
why would I be in my neighbor's house all of the time? Because I'm not supporting myself and I need my neighbor's help. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with a hand up. The problem is when it becomes a perpetual hand out, then it becomes different, where you're kind of depending upon your neighbor for self-sufficiency, and so you're always in your neighbor's house asking for this, that, or the other, to the point where you just wear down your neighbor. And that's what he's talking about here when he says, eat your own bread. Survive by the sweat of your own labor, not the sweat of your neighbor's labor, or your neighbor, over the course of time, will see through the veneer and resent you. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says, if anyone does not provide for his own, same word, especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Notice he doesn't say you are an unbeliever if you do this. He says you're acting like an unbeliever. And in fact, you're acting worse than an unbeliever because even the unsaved world doesn't act this way. They don't just, I mean, they, they work, they, they labor, they, they plan for the future economically, they have budgets that they live under. I mean, the unsaved world understands the concept of labor, industry, work. Um, and so when a Christian won't do that, they're actually worse than an unbeliever. By the way, this idea of worse than an unbeliever, this isn't the only time Paul talks about worse than an unbeliever. Um, when he deals with the Corinthians, in 1 Peter chapter, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 related to incest. You know, a man has his father's wife. He says the pagans don't even act this way. So it is an interesting theology that Paul is giving us here that a saved person that's out of fellowship with God can actually out sin an unbeliever. Uh, which is a frightening thing when you think about it. And the reason that's true, I didn't want to go this direction, but it just kind of came to my mind. As, as a Christian, you have two natures. This is very different right here than the teaching you're getting from John MacArthur and others that are very Calvinistic and Reformed in their perspective. They do not teach that the Christian has two natures. So if a Christian acts up, their solution is, well, you're not a Christian. Uh, I'm here to tell you that just because you've got a new nature, and praise God that we have it, amen, it doesn't mean your old nature just took a vacation. <laughs> I mean, do you guys, are you guys in here ever tempted by your old nature? Just put up your hand if, if I can see if that's true. And those of you that didn't put up your hand are being tempted by the old nature right now because <laughs> you're lying about it. <laughs> I mean, I can go back to that old nature anytime I want to. But the issue as a Christian is I don't have to because I have resources in Christ. I have to claim those moment by moment and walk by faith and obey what God tells me to do, but any time I want to as a Christian, I can volitionally. Now, when I was unsaved, I was more in a state of enslavement, but as a Christian, it's now more volitional. I can shut that off and go back to my old nature. So, if a man does not provide for his own household, then he's actually worse than an unsaved person, which unfortunately is a reality for some. And by the way, when we teach this doctrine of the carnal Christian, the John MacArthur Reformed camp thinks that we're saying we're in favor of the carnal Christian. It's like, yay, I can be carnal. Let's all go out and do that. That's not what we're saying. There's a lot of negative things that happen in the life of a Christian when they go back to the old nature. Teaching that it's possible and that it's good are two completely different things. But when they hear us teach, they think we're teaching carnal Christianity, which we're not. I like to call carnal uh, Christianity an unfortunate possibility. 
because I have two natures. You'll see those two natures in Romans 7, uh, Galatians 5, around verses uh, 16 and following. I mean, there are many, many places in the Bible that teach that. So that's why church discipline is necessary against saved people. If an unsaved person, or if a saved person rather, could never go back to the old nature, and you just want to call them an unbeliever, then there's really no need for church discipline, right? They're just not saved. But if a saved person can go back to the old nature, then the, then the notion of church discipline, ecclesiastical separation, you know, those kinds of things become, become needed, which is what Paul is dealing with here. So he says that they are to eat by the sweat of their own brow. Now, does that sound familiar? That goes right back to what God articulated after the fall of Adam and Eve in Eden. He said then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Now, listening to the voice of your wife can be a good thing. I've, I've seen people take that to mean never listen to the voice of your wife. I mean, some of the best advice I've ever gotten on anything is listening to the voice of my wife. But this is more specific to the context. Listening to the voice of your wife who is saying, go ahead and plunge into sin with me. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, curse it is the ground because of you. In toil, look at that. You will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So God, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, said, okay, you want to rebel against me? Fine. The earth itself is now going to rebel against you. So there's some sarcasm here. And when you go back to passages like Genesis 2, verse 15, you sort of get the impression that Adam was cultivating the garden and he was working and tilling the garden because he enjoyed doing that. When the, when the curse is removed, industry doesn't stop because in the eternal state, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, it talks about how the bondservants of Christ will perpetually serve him. So industry, productivity, has always been part of God's plan and will always be part of God's plan. It's just in this case, with the fall of man, it became different. Now man had to work to survive. He wasn't working out of enjoyment and fulfillment. He was working by the sweat of his brow for his own survival. And this is the, what I would call the siren song of socialism that the youth are sort of being swept into. And it's very attractive to their ears because the socialist will basically tell people, oh, you don't have to worry about the fall. You don't have to work to survive. You can work off someone else's sweat. And God says no. By the sweat of your face, your own face, um, you will eat your bread. So God's principle is this. If you want to work, or excuse me, if you want to eat, then go to work. I understand we can come up with exceptions. What about the person who is disabled and whatnot? And I don't think the Bible is dealing with every little exception of a person with a basic need. Um, but he's dealing with the general rule. The general rule is if you want to eat, then you have to work by the sweat of your own brow. Socialism, and what's the difference between a socialist and a Marxist? A Marxist is just a socialist who's in more of a hurry. Because both systems ultimately lead to the same place. I mean, they lead to this idea that the state or the government, cradle to grave, is going to provide everything for you. Socialism leading to Marxism 
says the exact opposite of what God says here. God says, you want to eat, you work off the sweat of your own brow. Socialism says, if you want to eat, then someone else will work. Now, the last time I checked, that's the definition of slavery, isn't it? I mean, if I'm eating because you're working, then you're my slave. So my point is, Marxism and socialism contradicts the principles of God very early on in Scripture. And all of the discussions about, you know, should we be a free market system? Should we be a socialist system? Should we be a communist system? Almost nobody brings this up. The truth of the matter is Marxism and socialism essentially never delivers what it promises. It it over promises but never delivers. And the reason it doesn't deliver is it because it rebels against what God said in chapter three, very early on in the Bible. You can't expect an economic system to work that goes against what God said. And that's why here in the United States, I mentioned this last time, we have this borders crisis. You have all of these people, and by the way, they're not just coming from Mexico. They're coming from all over the world. Uh, If you do some uh, research through the author Todd Benzman, an author, you know, he's done like first um, primary source research talking about where all these people are coming from. They're not just, they're not just coming from Mexico, they're coming from the Middle East and countless places around the world, China. And by the way, every time I see a picture of these mass, uh, I, I don't call them immigrations or migrations, I call them invasions. They always look to me to be very young people in their 20s of fighting age. That kind of bothers me. I mean, I'm not seeing grandmas and people in wheelchairs and crutches. I mean, I'm seeing this mass of very young people coming into this country. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, what in the world, what are they doing? What are they running from, first of all? Well, they're running from the utopian societies that they were promised in their own country, which collapsed or didn't work because it rebels against the principles of God um, on page one. You know, Fidel Castro, when he overthrew uh, Batista, what was that, late 1950s, early 1960s, you can watch him on closed circuit television, black and white television during the time. It's not like the Cubans could change the channel because that was the only channel they had where he would just go on and on Uh, To me, he looks sort of like he's demon-possessed, to be honest with you. I mean, hour after hour, and so don't complain about my long sermons, please. (laughs) He would go on hour after hour after hour promising um, the nirvana that he was going to bring in through his communist revolution. Get, Get the movie, if you're a movie watcher, the movie I think is called Sandoval. It's about a um, pool player in the United States, uh, Cuba rather, that came here to the United States. uh, What do they call it? Asylum and all of those kinds of things. And it really tells the true story of what happened in Cuba when Batista was overthrown. As Batista was overthrown, Castro brought in Marxism. Cuba became basically an island prison And now what you see is Cubans getting in these little, they're not even rafts, they're like holding onto boards and things, making this journey through shark-infested waters from uh, Havana to Miami, you know, with the hope of touching down on American shores. So why would someone do that? It's because the utopia that they were promised collapsed and turned really into a living hellhole. And one of the reasons it collapsed is it uh, is built on the wrong principles. I mean, it's built against Genesis 3 at the beginning. And when Cuba, when Cadastro took power and he was trying to overthrow Batista, all 
the Cubans could talk about was what a bad guy Batista was. Yeah, he was a bad guy. There were some human rights violations under Batista. No, no question about it. But it was far worse under Castro. And I want people to understand this because the same thing happened in Iran. When the Ayatollah toppled the Shah, Iran, 1979, under the, you remember, administration of Jimmy Carter at the time, all anybody could talk about was what a terrible guy the Shah was. And he was a bad person. There were lots of human rights violations under the Shah in Iran, just like there were lots of human rights violations under Batista in Cuba. But I guarantee you this much, that the Cubans long for the day with Batista back in power once Fidel took over. And the Iranians longed for the day of the Shah back in power once the Ayatollah took over. Because what the Ayatollah did is he basically turned Iran, Persia, uh, in, which we call Persia in the Bible, basically into a theocracy where women are forced and men too to wear these burqas in the hot Middle Eastern sun, uh, head to toe covered in this little slit of eyes where you can look. A woman isn't allowed to drive. A woman isn't allowed to have education. A man has a legal right to beat up his wife. It takes more weight in a court of law to overrule a woman's testimony than a man. I mean, he, they took Iran and they put it right back into the, something out of the seventh century. And, and I guarantee you the Iranians today would love to have the days of the Shah back in spite of the Shah's problems. This is how what's called the red-green axis, the co-working of Islam, green, and Marxism, red, topple countries all over the world. They talk about how, one, one, how bad one person is. Look at how mean his tweets are. Um, look at the guy doesn't even comb his hair correctly. It's flying all over the place. Look at he, he runs uh, casinos. And as you get focused on what, how bad person A is, it takes your eye off what they're doing with the other hand, right? That's a good magician, right? You get so focused on what's going on with this hand, you don't know what's going on with the other hand understanding that once they get rid of person A, they're gonna bring in something far worse. So I, have a, I run into a lot of Christians that do not believe in the lesser of two evils argument. There is a lesser of two evils argument when we're living in a fallen world. Jesus himself in Matthew 12 talked about lesser of two evils. He talked about when you exercise a demon out of a person it kind of rums the earth if that person, you know, is not in turn saved. The demon kind of rums the earth and it gets, what does it say there in Matthew 12? Seven buddies that are worse. And they go back into the same person and it says the last state of the person is worse than the first state. In other words, what the state that the person is in now is actually worse than uh, the original state they were in when they were indwelt by one demon. So if you, if, you don't, if you ignore the lesser of two arguments, you're ignoring what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. There is a lesser of two arguments. There is a lesser of two evils, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so there's a, there's a definite pattern in the world related to how Marxism and Islam take hold of host cultures. So obviously I'm bringing this to your attention because, I mean, this is the battle that we're in right now. I'm not telling you who to vote for. You can figure that on your own. I'm just telling you that the United States is being subjected to a pattern that was used to topple Cuba and turn it into something way worse. The United States right now is being subjected to a pattern that was used to topple uh, the Shah and Iran making it something today that is far worse.
we're going through the exact same issue. And the same kinds of arguments are being used. And the reason Islam and Marxism are such good friends is they have a lot in common. They both believe in massive totalitarian government. As you probably know, Islam, when you study the founding documents of Islam, the Quran, the Hadith, very little of it relates to religion. Did you know that? We look at Islam as a religion. Very little is actually related to religion. What it's really related to is Sharia law, political control over people. And Marxists say, we can cooperate with that agenda because that's where we're about to. Islam is far more than just a religion. It is a world conquest ideology that like Marxism, takes over country after country of uh, unsuspecting, naive, and very, very gullible people falling for very simplistic arguments. And very sadly, the Muslims and the Marxists co-op the pulpit. A lot of people hear these silly arguments. Oh, I'm, I reject the lesser of two evils argument kind of thing. I'm for social justice. Well, where do they get all that, that stuff from? They got it from their seminary or they got it from their, their pastor. So you're in a church that's a little different, I would say, <laughs> uh, where we actually speak against these things. So the red-green access is the Marxists and the Islamists will cooperate with each other because they both agree on the big picture. And the enemy of my enemy is my what? Is my friend. I mean, we're the enemy, the, the Sunday people as the Marxists call us, and the Islamists, I should say. First, we're gonna take out the Saturday people, that's the Jews, and then when we're done with them, we're gonna take out the Sunday people, that would be us. Isn't today Sunday? Didn't Jesus rise on the first day of the week? Um, and so why would you see uh, uh, Mus Muslims and Marxists work together? Why, why would you see somebody who's a feminist, women's rights, standing up for Islam, where women are treated like subclass citizens? Why would you see a homosexual activist standing up for Islam when Muslims take homosexuals in their own country and throw them off three-story buildings? I mean, that doesn't make any sense unless you understand the red-green access you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. We gotta cooperate with each other to get the job done over the ultimate prize, which is a free and prosperous United States of America. And once we get that done, we can turn on the Saturday people, we can turn on the Sunday people, and then we could iron out our differences, you know, at, at a later time, at, at a later date. You know, this guy, Jack Phillips, who, you know, starts these, has a bakery and he's an evangelical and the transgender folks come into his place of business demanding that he make a cake for a same-sex wedding and they drag him through court and they destroy his reputation and his livelihood and all of these kinds of things. Have you ever asked yourself why the same homosexual activists don't do that in a Muslim bakery? Because the Islamic views of homo against homosexuality are far sharper than ours. I mean, you're, you're, you're dead if you're a homosexual in, a, in an Islamic country. Have you seen these signs, homosexuals for Gaza? As our youth are marching around from the river to the sea, the land of Palestine shall be free. You see these signs that come up, homosexuals for Gaza? Well, how laughable is that? I mean, you go and you try to be a homosexual in Gaza. <laughs> and let me know how, that, how well that goes for you. But see, all of these basic contradictions, they just put aside because it's the red-green axis. They're, they're cooperating with each other because they've got more in common than what separates them because the enemy of my enemy uh, is my friend. 
So none of that was in my notes. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> if you didn't enjoy it, as we like to say, the exits are cl clearly marked. So why, why is it that everybody's running from these countries that promise them utopia? It's because these experiments that they're running around the world rebel against what God says on page one. Marxism says, you work, I eat. God says the opposite. If you want to work, then you eat. As uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with socialism or Marxism is you run out of opium. Other people's money. You run out of other people's money. Well, let's soak the rich. So you gotta create this mythical group of people, the rich, that we're against, and the economist said, if you took all of the rich in the United States, you could probably run our government for like less than a week if you liquidated all of their assets, if even that. So it's kind of getting us ramped up against the rich and this idea that if we just soak the rich, we can, we can pay for all of these uh, Marxist, socialist uh, redistribution schemes, and none of them are gonna work. The law of gravity still works in the United States, doesn't it? And if the law of gravity works in Venezuela, where the middle class is eating out of dumpsters, did you know that? Did you know when the Marxists took over Venezuela, they gave the same song and dance, and today the middle class is eating out of dumpsters? Uh, if, if, the, if the economic principles of God don't work in Venezuela, or better said, if rebellion against the e economic principles of God are bearing negative fruit in Venezuela, why in the world would we ever think that, oh, well, we just need to try it here in the United States and things will be fine? Well, gee, pastor, don't you believe in charity and a safety net? Of course I believe in all of that, but as we've said before, the problem is when the safety net becomes a hammock. That's the problem where you think that you can live off the sweat and industry of somebody else when God very early on in the Bible says life doesn't work that way. And may I just exhort you, you better be talking to your children and your grandchildren about this because they ain't gonna hear it anywhere else. They're certainly not gonna hear it from the media. Uh, they're certainly not gonna hear it from their, in many cases, public school curriculum. They gotta hear it from somebody. And you better be in a church that has a man of God that wants to talk about these things so you can be equipped to have the conversation, right? With your parents, and, uh, with your uh, children and your grandchildren. Socialism and Marxism, it doesn't work and it will never work because it rebels against the principles of God as early as Genesis um, chapter, chapter three. As Paul deals with this whole subject of exhorting the lazy to work, he talks about the need for patience. Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. I used to pray. <laughs> but uh, he says that in verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. Now, notice that the Thessalonians who are involved in this sin, the sin of using the second coming as an excuse for getting out of life's responsibilities, the Thessalonians are called brethren. So that becomes more evidence that a Christian has the ability to go back to the old nature and in this case, cater to laziness or what the book of Proverbs would call sloth under the banner that Jesus is coming back in, uh, within the next seven years. So a Christian can out an unbeliever any day of the week when they go back to the old nature. You know, R Ravi Zacharias, you no doubt heard about that, a great philosopher, apologetic, apologetic guy, debater, writer, you know, as you know, he had um, sexual immor immorality liaisons in all of his different ministry outlets, you know, dispersed throughout the world. 
And when that was uncovered, nobody really knew what to do with that. I mean, what do you do with a guy that's used by God? I would say he, he was used by God. But on the side, he's acting like this. I mean, he's living a double life. How could that be? And people started to say, well, he lost his salvation. That's the Arminian route. Other people say, well, he never had salvation. That's the perseverance of the saints Calvinist route. Um, I'm here to tell you folks that there's a totally different route here. You know, it, it could very well be that he was saved, he was regenerated, he was indwelt by the Spirit of God, and yet through perpetual decisions, and it's never with these situations of immorality, it's never a single decision. The saying has been given that the road to immorality is paved through gradual compromises. People don't wake up one day and find themselves in that level of immorality and turmoil. I mean, long before all that stuff happened, he, I can guarantee you, in his mind was making one bad decision after another, going back to the old nature. You might remember I preached a sermon about this called, Are You a Lot Like Lot? (laughs) Where we see the same thing in Genesis. Lot was clearly saved, because the New Testament, 2 Peter 2, verses seven through nine, tells us he was saved. But he just made a a ton of bad choices as a Christian. Uh, He was, pitched his tent towards Sodom, Genesis 13, Genesis 19, one, he's sitting at the city gates of Sodom. Um, He's, Later on, releasing his daughters to the sodomite crowd for sexual purposes. He finally gets spiritual and starts to talk about judgment coming and his in-laws think he's jesting and the whole story of Lot sadly ends with Lot in an incestuous relationship with his two daughters while he's drunk. And from those unholy unions, Genesis 19, verses 30 through 38, you can read all about it, came the Ammonites and the Moabites who became perennial enemies of Israel. So what do you do with Lot? What do you do with Ravi Zechariah? Well, people say he lost his salvation. Other people say he never had salvation. I'm here to tell you there's a completely different path here. Both individuals went back to the old nature, which the Christian has the ability to do. You don't have to do it, but you can do it. And you go back just for a little excursion, and that wasn't so bad. Now I'll take a a longer trip back to the sin nature, and a longer trip, and a longer trip, and eventually immorality in the life of a Christian can just be normalized as just another lifestyle. If you don't think as a Christian that you have the ability to do that, then you're confused and deceived already. One of the greatest lies Satan ever told the believer is a believer can't act that way. Yes, they can. And you see it here through this word, brethren. Which is not the use of the word fellow Jews. Sometimes brethren is used of fellow Jews. Romans 9, verse 3. That's not how Paul's using this word brethren here because his audience isn't really Jewish primarily. He was kicked out of the synagogue. He's using the word brethren as fellow members of the body of Christ. The same way Jesus used the word in Matthew 12, 46 through 50, where he was told your brother, your mother, your sister, etc., are waiting for you. And he said, who is my mother, brother, sister, but those who do the will of my heavenly Father. So when he calls them brethren here, acting like this, um, he's making it very clear that a Christian can act this way. Paul, as we've explained, develops the idea of a carnal Christian in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And I, brethren, cannot 
speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food. For you are not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? You people in Corinth that know Christ, you're acting worse than the unsaved person. That's what he's saying. Paul just took the world and he divided it in a half, unbelievers and believers. Most people stop there. But Paul, as he's unfolding the concept of the carnal Christian, starts using different words to explain the believers. There's the spiritual believer, not the believer that's sinless, but sinning less. There's the infant believer who's doing age-appropriate things. And then there's the carnal believer who keeps going back to the flesh and should have grown up a long time ago. When Paul deals with the brethren here, he's dealing with the carnal believer, the the lazy brethren, not being industrious, using spiritual terminology to sort of hide their their carnality, in this case, sloth or laziness. Let me just finish verse 13, and we'll call it a wrap here. Do not grow weary of doing good. So this is the law of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7, and 9, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. It's an an agrarian concept that whatever you put in the ground by way of sowing will come back up as a plant. You want a lemon tree, plant a lemon seed. You want an apple tree, plant an apple seed. Uh, If you want poison ivy, plant that. What if you don't want anything? Then don't do anything. Uh, As Sarah was going off to her program, we were trying to finish the Old Testament together. Had to rush through the last uh, couple of chapters in Ecclesiastes but we finished the Old Testament, father, daughter, reading the Bible together. And uh, I'm trying to work on a book right now with my free time <laughs> called the, the Bible and Voting, teaching Christians how to vote based on you know, biblical principles, some of the things we've talked about this morning. And uh, you know, it's really easy just to postpone, 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 because I'd rather just rest at the end of the day. So we're reading through Ecclesiastes, and we came to chapter 11, verse 4. And it says, He who watches the wind (laughs) will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. And the Holy Spirit says to me, Well, Andy, if you do nothing, you'll have no book at all. So the law of sowing and reaping, so that kind of motivated me to get a little busy at my computer when I really wanted to go to bed. I'm not giving a swan song or anything. I'm just telling you how the Lord uses these principles to to work in my life. So if you want to keep having this negative stuff happen in the church, keep putting bad seeds into the ground, which you as a Christian have the ability to do. If you want a different situation there in Thessalonica, then go back to my instructions and start putting good seeds into the ground. And if you do nothing, you're going to have nothing. So he talks here about not growing weary of doing good. Because it takes a little while, doesn't it? Between sowing and planting. I mean, you don't throw a seed into the ground and you get a plant the next 10 seconds. So when you're doing good, you're kind of wondering, is this really paying off? I mean, is this really going to benefit me? And it's easy when you're doing good to sort of get weary and well-doing. 
But Paul says, don't get weary in well-doing. You're respecting a basic agricultural principle and you will bear good fruit in good time. Amen. So there we go. We covered two verses. We'll pick it up with verse uh, 14 next time. Father, we're grateful for your word, grateful for your truth and how it speaks into our lives. Help us to be wise and discerning believers in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, yeah. happy intermission.